Hello, in this presentation I would like to talk about the usefulness or added value of the sagittal views in the ultrasound examination of the fetal CNS. As you know, in many official guidelines, the routine or screening exam of the fetal CNS is performed by the evaluation of only the axial planes of the fetal head, based in that they are easy to obtain and allow the detection of most of the fetal CNS anomalies. If in this basic or routine exam we found any abnormality, then it should be carried out by an expert and advanced SAM or neurosonography with the contribution of the sagittal and coronal planes in order to do a comprehensive multiplanar evaluation of the fetal CNS. And this is a protocol followed actually in many countries. However, in recent years, there are arising other guidelines in which they include the missagital view in the basic or routine in SAM for the direct visualization of the corpus callosum. In the Spanish guideline, the missagital plane, although no mandatory, is mentioned as advisable in the basic SAM. The reason for not including the sagittal planes in the routine exam is that it is difficult to obtain and it requires expertise for interpreting it. I think that once you know how to achieve it, it is not difficult to get in most cases and regarding the expertise, you won't progress and get experience if you do not even try to get it. Because if you are looking to the axial planes, you only need to orbit the transducer 90 degrees, as you can see in this video, to achieve the sagittal planes. All of you know how to get a nice image of the fetal profile, don't you? Well, when you are looking to the profile, you only need to move slightly the probe following the frontal contour until you insonate through the anterior front tunnel. If you are in the coronal view, you only need to twist the probe 90 degrees while you keep on looking at the corpus callosum to immediately get the sagittal view of it. And once you are in the missagittal plane, you only have to tilt the transducer from one side to the other to get the parasagittal views. And these are, in my opinion, the main contributions of the sagittal and parasagittal planes. They are essential for the evaluation of some brain structures and can also be very useful in the assessment of some other aspects. I think that the most important contribution of the sagittal view and the reason why I would advise to incorporate it in the routine exam is for a direct visualization and comprehensive evaluation of the corpus callosum. Secondly, the missagittal plane is crucial for a complete evaluation of the cerebellar vermis. This comprehensive assessment of the vermis is not part of the routine exam, but is mandatory in the advanced examination or neurosonography when we need to make a differential diagnosis of posterior fossa anomalies. And the third issue in which the sagittal planes are essential for the visualization and assessment of the midbrain and brainstem. Of course, in the context not of a routine exam, but of a neurosonography. The assessment of the corpus callosum is important because corpus callosum anomalies are one of the most common CNS anomalies just after ventriculomegaly and similar to neural tube defects. They represent the first cause of termination for brain anomalies in late gestation. Around one third are isolated, although in 15% of these cases, an associated anomaly will, will be detected after birth. 
and around two-thirds are associated with other CNS or extra-CNS anomalies that will affect the prognosis. Regarding the corpus callosum anomalies, there are two issues that I would like to comment. One is regarding the definitions or nomenclature, and the other is about measuring it. There is a big heterogeneity and confusion among the literature when defining these anomalies. As it is very nicely described in this paper from the group of East Bill and Lord Lawrence Salmon. I will only put an example. The term hypoplasia is defined very differently depending on the paper. And while from some authors an hypoplastic corpus callosum is the one that has normal length but it is thin, for others is when it is thin and short and for other is when it is thin or short. Therefore, it's a very obvious that is needed an effort and consensus for the standardization of corpus callosum anomalies classification and terminology. So in this proposal, we will have a complete agenesis of the corpus callosum and the partial agenesis when one or more parts are missing. When the corpus callosum is complete but it is thin or short, then we should talk about an hypoplastic corpus callosum. While if it is thick or has an abnormal shape, we should talk about a dysplastic corpus callosum. And then we have another important issue. How to define the thin, short, or thick corpus callosum? This is an, imp an important question because there have been published several reference charts for the length, width, and thickness of the corpus callosum with different number of patients and using different methods, 2D, 3D, and also MRI and very recently have been published several studies and reviews analyzing the methodology and quality of these reference charts. All these reviews reached to the same conclusions. The methodology used for creating this chart was poor in most of them with high risks of biases. Those of you who come gray hair will remember Professor Nicolaides putting a similar slide in many lectures, pushing us to objectify all our findings. These were the best type of images of the corpus callosum that we were able to obtain three decades ago. With such images, the measurement of the corpus callosum was challenging. But with current technology, we can obtain this kind of images that seem to be shouting at us, please measure me. So the question is, should we measure the corpus callosum taking into account that there is not enough evidence about the long-term outcome of isolated, thin, thick or short corpus callosum and that most of the reference charts have important methodological uses. The ISO guidelines states that short, thin, or thick is not necessarily a synonymous of abnormality and advocates for a qualitative assessment rather than measuring the corpus callosum. So the, there is a growing opinion among experts and I have asked some of them to allow me to use AI to complete this slide. We should not measure the corpus callosum if everything else in the ultrasound examination of the fetal CNS looks normal. Please do not, do not measure the corpus callosum if the rest of the fetal CNS looks normal because you create concern and anxiety in the parents and it can be one of the 5% false positive rate that may end with an unjustified termination of pregnancy. 
My point of view regarding the corpus callosum is not to measure it routinely and only check that it is there and it is complete. I find difficult to advocate a screening test that has a 5% false positive rate that may result in termination of pregnancy when I have absolutely no idea about long-term outcome. So please be very, very careful in using sent out charts. Yeah, you must use a chart. Please make sure that you follow exactly the same methodology used to create the chart. And if you're going to measure it, you should know what to do with the results. And if you know what to do, please let me know. So according with the majority consensus among experts, we may have to modify the Galileo Galilei sentence because in relation with the corpus callosum, it's probably better to do not measure it if everything else looks normal. So it's a majority agreement that the important thing is to check if all the five parts of the corpus callosum are present rather than measuring it. And if you decide to measure, you should follow the same methodology used for creating the chart in which you are going to plot the, your measurements. If you are using conventional 2D ultrasound, I will suggest to use this chart of Tinini and colleagues due to the big numbers of cases included, especially in between 21 and 23 weeks. In daily practice, there are some tips that can be useful for a quick assessment of the corpus callosum length. That in the second trimester should be around one third of the occipital frontal distance. And in the third trimester, the splenium of the corpus callosum must reach the ambient or quadrigeminal system at the level of the lamina tecti. Another practical hint is to verify that the splenium reaches the indentation of the number three shape formed by the fornix and the lamina tecti. Moving to the sonographic diagnosis of the corpus callosum at Genesis, there have been described several indirect signs, not only in the axial planes, but also in the sagittal and coronal views. The problem with the invariant signs is that they are good to identify a complete agenesis, but they have some limitations because not always will all be present in a complete agenesis. They can change through our session and can be missing in cases of partial agenesis or dysplastic corporal callosum. And in order to increase the detection rate of these cases in the axial planes, has been proposed to look at the cavum safety velocity ratio or the anterior and posterior complexes. But despite all these indirect signs, in some cases of partial agenesis, we will not be able to detect them in the axial planes. Therefore, for the correct evaluation of the corpus callosum anomalies, we need to perform a multiplanar assessment in which the mid-sagittal view is absolutely mandatory in order to get the direct sign, that is, the non-visualization of the whole corpus callosum or a segment of it. Even though most current guidelines do not include the mid-sagittal plane in the routine exam, if we keep on trying to visualize the corpus callosum in the mid-sagittal plane in all our routine examinations, we will become familiar with the normal appearance along gestation. And at this point, we will be able to immediately recognize the abnormalities of the shape and size. And this confidence in detecting the abnormal corpus callosum is really important because After reading the literature published in the last 15 years about the outcome of the corpus callosum anomalies, we can conclude that all the corpus callosum anomalies, irrespectively of its extent, complete or partial or dysplastic, have almost the same outcome. But we must remember that 
there is not enough evidence about the outcome in cases of isolated and subtle or mild thin, thick, short corpus callosum. And because of this, the recommendation is not to measure it if everything else in the Fita CNX looks normal. When we find a corpus callosum anomalies, the main issue is to determine if there is any other associated anomaly that will be present in about three quarters of cases. If after all the complementary studies that we must perform, we cannot find anything else, then we can consider that it is an isolated case. In isolated corpus callosum anomalies, there is almost 80% chance to have a normal outcome or with very mild impairment. But we have to inform the parents about the 20% chance of a moderate to severe adverse outcome. And remember that the outcome is similar, both in complete or partial agenesis, and that disabilities can appear years later. Therefore, it's important a close follow-up from birth to school age to detect deficits that can benefit from early intervention. So, counseling in corpus callosum anomalies is very challenging, and it should not only be based in the ultrasound findings, but also in the presence of any associated anomaly that we determine the final prognosis. And here, genetics plays a very important role. As there are more than 200 genetic syndromes associated with corpus callosum anomalies. And in order to investigate a genetic origin in corpus callosum anomalies, in the near future, we will move from the array to the exome sequencing because of the high diagnostic yield of exome sequencing in corpus callosum agenesis as has been recently demonstrated in this review, that can be as high as 32% of the apparently isolated cases of corpus callosum agenesis. For a correct counseling in cases of partial agenesis, we will probably need to consider which part is affected. Not only because, due to the bidirectional development of the corpus callosum, we can presume or guess the more likely etiology depending on the missing part of the corpus callosum, but also because some studies suggest that depending on the region of the corpus callosum affected, we may expect different types of neurocognitive impairments. And in the next future, we may obtain useful additional information from the three Tesla tractography and diffusion tensor imaging that are the only non-invasive techniques for visualizing connectivity disorders. And this information may be crucial for a better counseling. The second main contribution of the mid-sagittal plane is for a comprehensive assessment of the cerebellar vermis. For the assessment of the vermis, we need the sagittal plane. As you know, the cerebellar vermis has nine lobes, and in prenatal ultrasound, we can distinguish the fastigium of the fourth ventricle and the indentation of the primary fissure that divides the vermis in two portions. The superior portion should be one-third and the inferior portion should be two-thirds of the total area of the vermis. This is the vermis ratio. To visualize the cerebral vermis, we can use the insonation through the anterior fontanelle, which will provide us with an acceptable quality in many cases. But if we really need the best resolution, in most cases the insonation through the posterior fontanelle will give us much more details. If we are doing a neurosonography or advanced exam, we have to measure the craniocaudal and anterior posterior diameters of the cerebral vermis. The problem 
is that, once again, there are different definitions of the craniocaudal diameter of the vermis in the literature. Although in daily practice, probably there is not significant difference between all these definitions of the craniocaudal diameter. However, something quite different occurs with the anterior-posterior diameter that has also different definitions in the literature that lead to significant difference in measurements. As you can see in this example, if we use the methodology described by Malinger in red, the measurements will be almost double than the one obtained with other published methodology. So once again, the same message when measuring brain structures, we must follow the same methodology used in the reference chart in which we are going to plot that measurement. I remember the great concern that the six in the recent literature regarding the reference charts of brain structures. If you need to measure the craniocaudal diameter of the cerebellar vermis, I will suggest to use this chart based in the measurements of more than 10,000 patients. For a more accurate measurement of the vermian size, we can also measure the surface area and the contour of the vermis. In posterior fossa anomalies, we can also measure in the mid-sagittal view the brainstem vermian angle and the brainstem tentorian angle to quantify the rotation of the vermis. These angles can be useful in the differential diagnosis of posterior fossa anomalies. There are several ultrasound features that can assist us in the differential diagnosis of the most frequent posterior fossa anomalies. And for evaluating most of these items, the missagittal view is essential. At this point, I would like to remind you that last year has been proposed a new definition for the dandy worker malformation in which the elevation of the tentorion is not more a mandatory requisite. As you already know, these are the old requisites for the diagnosis of dandy worker malformation. And this is the new definition proposed in this paper in which have been included quantitative conditions as the tegmentovermian angle and the fascicular recess angle, and also the position of the corneal plexus or the presence of the tidal sign. As you can see, the authors propose that the posterior fossa size or the elevation of the dentorium should not more be considered mandatory requisites. The third main contribution of the missagital plane is for the evaluation of the brainstem in the context of a neurosonography or advanced fetal CNS exam. As you know, the brainstem is formed by the midbrain and the two most anterior portions of the hindbrain, that is the pons and the medulla oblongata. For the visualization of the brainstem, the best approach is the missagittal plane. But if we insonate through the anterior fontanelle, most of the times we will not get a clear vision because of shadowing. Therefore, for a clear visualization of the brainstem, it is much better to insonate through the sagittal suture or the posterior fontanelles. At this level, we can perform some measurements described for the differential diagnosis of some anomalies as the tectal length, the anterior-posterior midbrain diameter, the anterior-posterior pons diameter, or the anterior-posterior diameter of the fourth ventricle. Of course, all these measurements are only done in the context of our neurosonography when we need to confirm or rule out a specific anomaly of the brainstem. Of course, there have been published reference charts for all these measurements, but we must be aware of the methodology used in these charts. In these three, 
they used conventional 2D but with a different definition of the anterior posterior pons diameter. And this other chart was done using 3D multiplanar reconstruction, while this chart was based in MRI data. So once again, the same message. If you measure, you must follow the same methodology used it in the reference chart that you are going to use. In the neurosonographic assessment of the brainstem in the sagittal plane, we have to check its shape and alignment. We must be aware that in the first semester, the brainstem has a physiological C-shape or kinking that has to change to a straight shape beyond 14 weeks. Therefore, the persistence of a C-shaped kinked brainstem beyond 14 weeks should be considered pathologic and requires a complete neurosonographic assessment. In addition to the assessment of the corpus callosum, cerebral vermis and brainstem, the sagittal planes are also essential to detect indirect signs of neural tooth defects in the first trimester. As the intracranial translucence is described by Professor Chawi, or the ratio between the brainstem and the brainstem to occipital bone distance or the maxillocipital line. So the sagittal views are also essential in the first trimester. Then we have some other scenarios in which the sagittal and parasagittal planes can assist us. As for the evaluation of the ventricular system. In the routine exam, we usually evaluate the lateral ventricles in the axial plane. But for a complete assessment of the lateral ventricles, we need to do a multiplanar evaluation. And the parasagittal planes will allow a complete visualization of the lateral ventricles, showing the three horns at the same time. And this parasagittal plane is also the best for the visualization of the hippocampus. The third ventricle can be seen in normal conditions in the axial plane as two parallel lines separating both thalami. It can also be evaluated in the coronal planes below the cavum-septi pellucidi. But the best approach to display the third ventricle is going to the sagittal plane. Look how nicely we can demonstrate the shape and boundaries of the third ventricle and don't forget to check the interthalamic adhesion. The cerebral aqueduct or aqueduct of Silvius is very prominent in the first trimester and also clearly seen in the axial views during the early second trimester. But beyond 18 or 19 weeks, its visualization in the axial planes is rare. So in the second and third trimesters, if we want to visualize the aqueduct, we must go to the mesagittal plane and following the recommendations of Fernando Vinyas in this paper, we should insonate through the posterior fontanelle until we see the medial portion of the aqueduct or ampulla as a corporate tubular structure slightly concave lying ventrally to the midline tectum. The fourth ventricle is the smallest ventricle at term and in adult life. And interestingly, is the first that can we see and the most prominent structure of the ventricular system in the first trimester. During the first half of pregnancy, we can see in the axial planes a communication between the fourth ventricle and the cisterna magna. And this should be considered a normal finding until week 18 or 19. The sagittal plane is useful to visualize and access the fastigium of the fourth ventricle with its characteristic triangular shape pointing to the vermis. The serapinate space and cisterns are communicated with the ventricular system and the mesagittal and parasagittal planes can also be helpful in the evaluation of many of these cisterns. And to get a nice overview of the seragnate space, 
at the same time that we assess the surface of the brain and the brain parenchyma. Although for the quantification of the saracnoid space, we, may, we must measure the craniocortical distance and the synocortical distance in the coronal plane at the level of the foramen of morro. The parasagittal views can also assist us in the evaluation of the cortical surface and brain parenchyma. The cortical surface assessment can be done throughout gestation in the mesagital and parasagital planes in order to rule out cortical development malformations. The parasagital views are good to check the brain parenchyma and periventricular tissue. Look how nicely we can assess the brain lamination in the coronal view by transvaginal approach. and here in the parasagittal plane. This is the intermediate zone subplate line. That as has been described just last month in this very nice paper from Ro Birmon and colleagues, it cannot be detected before 15 weeks and it can be seen after 17 weeks in all cases. There are also some sulky and gyri that are better evaluated in the sagittal views. As the cingulate gyros that should be seen always beyond 27 weeks of gestation. And these sagittal views are also very helpful for the diagnosis of abnormal patterns of sulcation, as in this 20 weeks fetus, or this case of corpus callosonogenesis with the characteristic radiating sulcus. We need also the sagittal views to confirm the normal path of the pericardiosal arteries close to the corpus callosum. In cases with partial or complete agenesis of the corpus callosum, we will see an abnormal branching and course of these arteries. We may also see an anterior displacement of the anterior cerebral artery, giving us the snake under the skull sign very suggestive of all of prosencephaly. And just a few months ago, Carl and Chawi have described the evaluation in the sagittal view of the telacoroidea to anterior cerebral artery distance as a useful marker to identify fetuses with corpus callosum agenesis. And last but not least, whenever we see an abnormal finding in the routine axial examination, we should perform a neurosonography with a multiplanar assessment in which with the sagittal views can give us additional and key information. And just a, as an example, remember the cabin safety pellucid should be seen from 18 weeks onwards in the axial planes as an anechoic structure with triangular or rectangular shape in between both lateral ventricle frontal horns. And in the mid-sagittal plane should be seen also an echoic below the corpus callosum. In the very early second trimester, the cabin is occupied by the supporting cells of the laminar reunions that at 17 or 18 weeks are reabsorbed and replaced by fluid, giving the anechoic aspect to the cabin set to pellucidity. Sometimes the reabsorption of this cellular component is delayed, as in this case, with a strange appearance of the cabin set tipelucidi in the axial planes at 20 weeks, and in, in which the missagital plane showed that the, this reabsorption was not yet completed, and because of this, there were some echoic areas and some anechoic ones. Something similar occurred in this other case at 28 weeks in which the cabin septipelucidy 
had an abnormal aspect in the axial planes. With echoic areas, these ones, and in other planes, an anechoic portion was observed, this one. The sagittal planes demonstrated clearly that the cellular component did not complete yet this reabsorption in the anterior part of the cable safety velocity. In this case, at 21 weeks, there is not a cable visible in the axial planes. But the arterial horns are not communicated. And in the sagittal view, we can see the leaves of the septum pellucidum that are fused. And that is why there is no cavity. So in this case, the septum pellucidum is present without cavity or cavum. I hope you enjoyed this talk from Guillermo. He created this avatar with artificial intelligence to introduce the last slide with some take home messages. And for this slide, I use it AI with permission of some experts in fetal CNS ultrasound. As Guillermo said, the mid sagittal view is crucial for a proper evaluation of the corpus callosum anomalies, especially in cases of partial agenesis or dysplastic corpus callosum. The sagittal view is the best for a comprehensive evaluation of the cerebellar remise. Therefore, can be very helpful in the differential diagnosis of posterior fossa cystic anomalies. Well done, Guillermo. I agree with Guillermo, and I think that the sagittal views will give us very important information about the midbrain and the, and the hindbrain and are essential for a proper evaluation of the brainstem. Although many current guidelines do not include the sagittal planes in the basic or screening exam of the fetal CNS, I recommend you to try to get this sagittal view in all your ultrasound examinations for a direct visualization of the corpus callosum and cerebellar brainness. It is not difficult to achieve in more than 80% of the cases, adding only a few seconds to your exam. So come on and try to get it. Thank you very much for your attention.